Hey folks, thanks for tuning in. I wanted to talk maybe a little bit of like a stream of consciousness on why I stopped treating SIBO just with antimicrobials. And this has been a long time coming. It's been something that I've been doing for years now and haven't really shared it. I haven't, you know, really discussed it too much. And when new patients come to me, you know, maybe they've watched a video on YouTube and, you know, they know they have SIBO and they've come to me. Not that they get confused, but, um, you know, it's kind of a new concept that they have to digest. So I wanted to share that here just to kind of prime you if you're trying to treat SIBO and you can't overcome SIBO, you've been through rounds of treatment, you might get better, then you get worse, then something happens, and then you regress. I just wanted to share why I don't just rely on antimicrobials for SIBO treatment. And the big piece, we just want to fast forward right to the conclusion, is because it doesn't work, right? If it works for you, great. You wouldn't be watching this video. You'd be off living your life, eating whatever you want, and um, you know, iron gut fully resolved, right? So if you have tried to treat small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and um, it has not worked, it has not um, you've been eradicated, or you've regressed, this is the video for you. So don't do it because it doesn't work. It doesn't mean I don't use herbal antimicrobials and I do not mind, I do not shy away from using strong herbal antimicrobials when it's indicated. I don't start there um, because I like to leave that wiggle room for stronger therapies if we need them. And the back of the napkin kind of math there is that the stronger the therapy, the higher the likelihood that you will not tolerate it, right? And so if we start off at 11, when you only needed a kind of four out of 10, we've, you know, kind of lost this whole um, wiggle room. And often when you use strong herbal antimicrobials, you kind of have to put the pieces back together on the other end. It's not so much that you can do, you know, irreparable damage. I don't really think that anymore, unless you are using very, very high doses for a very long period of time. And so, you know, back when I used to treat a lot more parasite overgrowth, um, I still do, but I don't focus on them um, exclusively. I don't actually see them that often anymore you know, people would say, look, I'm gonna go do antibiotics. I'm gonna go do triple therapy. I'm gonna hit it with three antibiotics in one go, maybe multiple times. I'm actually gonna do a colonic infusion of antibiotics and you're just like pulling your hair out, like, please don't do that. You are going to regret it most likely. And that's the patients that I see. They're like, why did I ever do this? I'm so much uh, more unwell now, more symptomatic, more food intolerances, less resilience that's when you would lean into super strong therapies um, as a way to kind of head off that and get results faster or sooner. Um, but initially, with the SIBO piece, I have started to look at SIBO, and I've been looking at it for years now, so not started, but I look at SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, as a symptom. This is the paradigm shift that needs to happen in our industry and it is gonna do a world of good for you as someone who's dealing with treatment resistant SIBO to start thinking about it as a symptom. What does that mean? I mean, maybe symptom, that might be too kind of strong wording, but more of like a sustaining factor. And so patients will come to me, they'll be trying to treat SIBO for a decade, can't get over it. You can see their labs go back 10 years sometimes and they tell me what they've done because it's important to review and they say, look, I've done rifaximin, I've done oregano oil, I've done berberine, I've done candybactin AR, candybactin BR, they keep the neem, they keep kind of going down through a garlic, garlic extracts and um, either they saw no benefit or they experienced what I call the honeymoon phase where a week two weeks while they were on treatment, a month, six months, they felt better, and then full regression back to square one, sometimes worse, right? And so that tells me that they haven't addressed why they wound up with SIBO in the first place. And so when you start to think about it as a symptom of a deeper dysregulation, what caused bacteria to grow where the body should not let it grow, right? That's, that's what 
gets people better and keeps them better. And that does not mean that you do not need herbal antimicrobials to address that sustaining factor. You still might need to address you know, the end result, which is the bacterial overgrowth, but the thing that keeps people better once they get through that active treatment is resolving what broke down to allow bacteria to grow in the wrong spot. So the proof in the pudding right there, you know, that could just be me making something up, but you know, trust me, I see it all the time. Every day in the clinic, I'll see people new come to the clinic and say, look, can't get over this, might feel better than I feel worse on the SIBO front. Test, it's gone up, it's gotten worse, it was better for a while, and now it's back. Um, very, very common stories would be the hideous, the scary high number of relapse rates in the scientific literature. And so frontline therapies from biomedicine would be rifaximin, and it is a SIBO-specific antibiotic, um, appears to be safer on the gut. I have less of a concern with rifaximin than you know, your kind of traditional antibiotics. There are still you know, side effects and downsides to rifaximin. I still pe see people, patients, who say, look, I wish I never did rifaximin, it made me worse, but it's way less common compared to antibiotics, typical antibiotics, which are commonly people's never been well since moment. They said, I was doing fine, I got a UTI, I got a throat infection, whatever, strep throat, did antibiotics. I have not been well since then, that was my problem. Um, but you know, with something like rifaximin, you do see an incredibly high relapse rate with successful treatment of SIBO. So you'll see uh, studies where people go through, they get tested, they're positive, they get treated with rifaximin, and they retest SIBO negative and then six months later they'll retest and the relapse rate is through the roof. It's um, you know unsatisfactory. <laughs> so um, that's just proof in the pudding on what I'm talking about which you might be experiencing. So we'll talk about the four common root cause drivers of SIBO that I see in the clinic. There are definitely way, way, way more, but these are the big hitters. You could probably encompass about 80 or 90% of kind of SIBO patients that I see. Um, and they are the big ones that I would focus on and reflect with you and test and explore and discuss with your practitioner. But number one would be slow motility. Anyone who's been watching this uh, channel for a while be sick of me talking about motility, but I see it as a common root cause driver for gut dysfunction, overgrowth. It's a very strong sustaining factor. Things just sitting in your gut, not moving, speed them up people feel better and that's why you will just see loads and loads of um, you know info in the blogosphere on pro kinetics things that stimulate uh, gut motility through the digestive tract sweep the digestive tract free and clear and a major kind of root cause driver there I mean there's a whole bunch of things that can you know trigger slow motility but I see a whole lot of food poisoning events uh, post-infectious IBS is a real and obvious and common root cause driver for something like SIBO things sit around bacteria starts fermenting and growing in the wrong spot then you've got SIBO you kill the SIBO with antimicrobials or antibiotics, you feel better, and then because you haven't dealt with the slow motility, it builds back up, you're back to square one. Number two would be like a downregulation or a block or insufficient uh, flow of bile, stomach acid, you know, inadequate stomach acid production is another very strong kind of predisposing event for SIBO. And then the third piece around kind of like secretions, stomach acid, bile flow. And the third really big one that I see all the time, it can be this like chicken or egg piece, would be enzyme release from the pancreas and I am very passionate about this because I see it a lot I look for it I see it poorly treated I see it neglected I see uh, certain specialists in uh, biomedicine gastroenterologists you know kind of approach this from a different angle not my personal angle but if you have a um, test showing that your uh, pancreas is not producing sufficient enzymes right your exocrine function of the pancreas 
The endocrine function of the pancreas is to produce insulin to regulate your blood sugar. The exocrine function of the pancreas, which people might not be aware of, is to produce enzymes to digest your food. And you can do testing, elastase one, it's on my favorite stool test that I recommend all the time. Um, frequently we see this low normal, and sometimes we see it lab low, and that is a strong sustaining event and can be a predisposing event for SIBO. It can also be a result of SIBO as well. So that's the whole chicken and egg piece there. Um, so we're talking secretions. Those are strong kind of predisposing events for SIBO. And then another really big one would be ecosystem damage. And here we're talking about the large bowel mainly, which is a lot more complex and diverse. And you're, you're talking about uh, a slower moving kind of ecosystem where things sit around a little bit longer normally and ferment, which is normal, byproducts of healthy gut fermentation, things like butyrate, low acidic large bowel is healthy. And when you get that loss of butyrate production, mainly there's other short chain fatty acids, but butyrate really takes the cake there. When you get that uh, loss of healthy bacteria fermenting and producing butyrate, you get uh, an expansion or an overgrowth of pro-inflammatory bacteria, which can translocate to the small bowel. Um, that's a really, really big piece. And then you just think, why did I wind up there? Back to antibiotics, right? Take antibiotics, you know, kill off butyrate producers. The oxygen then becomes um, more aerobic, more oxygen kind of, sorry, the large bowel becomes more aerobic, oxygen influxing into the large bowel, and then less friendly bugs can proliferate because they're a little bit more flexible and um, adaptive compared to uh, some of the more beneficial butyrate producers. So the fourth piece that I don't see often, but it's worth mentioning would be uh, structural issues. I do treat a bunch of SIBO patients that had or have endometriosis or the lesion, adhesions, you know, C-sections, um, you know, that scar tissue. Structural issues can definitely impact motility, so that's back to motility and your ability to sweep things through. So it's worth mentioning and uh, it's something that I see sometimes. I'm, it's definitely on my radar, um, but it's not top of the pile. So hopefully that was helpful. If you're trying to treat SIBO and you're not having much success, I would go back to the whiteboard, look for your root cause, which is very much part of your history. To me, in the intake for an initial patient, we spend about um, you know, 30, 40 minutes going over the case. And part of that is where you're at now, what are your symptoms? That helps us get to, oh, look, actually, I think it is a SIBO case, if you didn't know it. Um, and then the other really big piece is your history. So we spend a good chunk of time talking about what got you to where you are now. And then if you're someone who's got a whole bunch of history treating it, what worked, what didn't work, what did you react to, what helped, you know, that, that's massively insightful. And then we use that to recommend in the treatment plan, testing and also treatment to start with. So if it's helpful, like, comment, and subscribe. And if you need gut support and you're in Australia or New Zealand, then there will be a booking link in the description below.